from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out today. My name is Amy Stoles. I'm the Literature Program Officer at the National Endowment for the Arts. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you the lovely and talented Tayari Jones. <laughs> You're in for a treat today, and I'll tell you why you're in for a treat, but first I'm going to plug Terry's website, terryjones.com. On her beautiful website, terryjones.com, you can read all about her three superb novels and distinguished literary awards and achievements. I'm limited on time, so tip of the iceberg. Leaving Atlanta is her moving debut novel, published in 2002, which delves into the horrific murder of 30 African-American children in the late 70s, early 80s. It won the Hurston Wright Award for debut fiction and was named Novel of the Year by Atlanta Magazine. Following her second novel, The Untelling, published in 2005, Essence Magazine called Teari a writer to watch. In 2011, her third novel, Silver Sparrow, was published and it thrust Teari into stardom. The novel, also set in Atlanta in the 1980s, is about James Witherspoon's families, the public one and the secret one. The daughters from each family meet and form a volatile, volatile friendship, as only one of them knows their sisters. The novel was chosen among the best of the year by Library Journal, O Magazine, Slate, and Salon, and as an honor book by the Black Caucus of the American Lit Library Association and it was nominated for an NAACP Image Award and is a finalist for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. But as I said, it's all there and more on her website where she also blogs. You should check that out too. You'll see that even in her everyday writing, she's full of these beautiful dichotomies. She's both humble and proud and sassy and sensitive and serious and very funny. She puts herself out there writing about subjects that really matter. But the truth is, and why you're really in for a treat, is you're going to see her today in person. You're going to hear that soft, easy, buttery voice of hers that makes it feel as if she's sitting right next to you, leaning in, touching your sleeve, sharing a secret. Teori writes like she speaks, and she speaks with such heart and honesty and eloquence about being black, about being a woman, about being a writer, about being human, you can't not love her and see things the way she sees things. I actually met Teari about seven years ago at a festival in Mississippi when I was just starting out as a writer. And she was so nice to me, so supportive and open and encouraging. We hung out there. <laughs> and then later on, a little bit when she came to DC for a semester to teach. Now, fast forward to the fall of 2011, and now I'm on the phone with her telling her that she just won a $25,000 NEA fellowship. I do think she screamed, <laughs> and then she texted me like once a week after that for the next month, celebrating, she wrote, champagneing, and then like three weeks later, still champagneing. It was so tayari, it was adorable. It's a real thrill for me to say in public, and, and this is really from my heart, success couldn't have happened to a nicer, more deserving, talented person. Please join me in welcoming Tayari Jones. Silver Sparrow, and then after that, I just thought we would all just talk about it. I feel this is a novel where I kind of put it all on the line with the first sentence. Chapter One, The Secret. My father, James Witherspoon, is a bigamist. He was already married 10 years when he first clamped eyes on my mother. In 1968, she was working at the gift wrap counter at Davidson's downtown when my father asked her to wrap the carving knife he had bought his wife for their wedding anniversary. Mother says that she knew that something wasn't right between a man and a woman when the gift was a blade. I said the 
but maybe that means there is some kind of trust between them. I love my mother, but we tend to see things a little bit differently. The point is that James's marriage was never hidden from us. James is what I call him. His other daughter, Charisse, the one who grew up in the house with him, she calls him daddy even now. When most people think of bigamy, if they think of it at all, they imagine some primitive practice taking place on the pages of National Geographic. In Atlanta, we remember one sect of the Back to Africa movement that used to run bakeries in the West End. Some people said it was a cult. Others said it was a cultural movement. Whatever it was, it involved four wives for each husband. The bakeries have since closed down, but sometimes we still see the women, resplendent in white, trailing six humble paces behind their mutual husband. Even in Baptist churches, ushers keep smelling salts on the ready for the new widow, confronted at the wake by the other grieving widow and her stair-step kids. Undertakers and judges know that it happens all the time, and not just between religious fanatics, traveling salesmen, handsome sociopaths, and desperate women. It's a shame that there isn't a true name for a woman like my mother. My father, James, is a bigamist. That's what he is. Laverne is his wife. She found him first, and my mother has always respected the other woman's squatter's rights. But was my mother his wife, too? She has legal documents and even a single Polaroid proving that she stood with James Alexander Witherspoon, Jr. in front of a judge just over the state line in Alabama. However, to call her only his wife doesn't really explain the full complexity of her position. There are other terms, I know, and when she is tipsy, angry, or sad, Mother uses them to describe herself, concubine, whore, mistress, consort. There are just so many, and none are fair. And they're nasty words, too, for a person like me, the child of a person like her, but these words were not allowed in the air of our home. You are his daughter. End of story. If this was ever true, it was in the first four months of my life before Charisse, his legitimate daughter, was born. My mother would curse at hearing me use that word, legitimate, but if she could hear the other word that formed in my head, she would close herself in her bedroom and cry. In my mind, Charisse is his real daughter. With wives, it only matters who gets there first. With daughters, the situation is a bit more complicated. It matters what you call things. Surveil was my mother's word. If he knew, James would probably say spy, but that's too sinister. We didn't do damage to anyone but ourselves as we trailed Charisse and Laverne while they wound their way through their easy lives. I had always imagined that we would eventually be asked to explain ourselves, to press words forward in our own defense. On that day, my mother would be called upon to do the talking. She is gifted with language and is able to layer difficult details in such a way that the result is smooth as water. She is a magician who can make the whole world feel like a dizzy illusion. The truth is a coin she pulls from behind your ear. Maybe mine was not a blissful girlhood, but is anyone's? Even people whose parents are happily married to each other and no one else? Even these people have their share of unhappiness. They spend plenty of time nursing old slights rehashing squabbles. So you see, I have something in common with the whole world. Mother didn't ruin my childhood or anyone's marriage. She is a good person. She prepared me. Life, you see, is all about knowing things. That is why my mother and I shouldn't be pitied. Yes, we have suffered, but we never doubted that we enjoyed one peculiar advantage when it came to what really, what really mattered. I knew about Charisse. She didn't know about me. My mother knew about Laverne, but Laverne was under the impression that hers was an ordinary life. We never lost track of this basic and fundamental fact. Now, when did I first discover that although I was an only child, my father was not my father and mine alone? I really can't say. It's something that I've known for as long as I've known that I had a father. I can only say for sure when I learned that this type of double duty daddy wasn't ordinary. I was about five years old in kindergarten when the art teacher, Miss Russell, asked us to draw pictures of our families. While all the other children scribbled with their crayons, I used a blue ink pen and drew James, Charlize, and Laverne. In the background was Raleigh, my father's best friend, the only person we knew from his other life. 
I drew him with the crayon label Flesh because he was really light skinned. This was years and years ago, but I still remember. I hung a necklace around the wife's neck. I gave the girl a big smile stuffed with square teeth. Near the left margin, I drew my mother and me standing by ourselves. The art teacher approached me from behind. Now, who are these people you've drawn so beautifully? Charmed, I smiled up at her. My family, my daddy has two wives and two girls. Cocking her head, she said, I see. I didn't think that much more about it. I was still enjoying the memory of the way she pronounced beautifully. To this day, when I hear anyone say that word, I feel loved. At the end of the month, I brought all my drawings home in a cardboard folder. James opened up his wallet, which he kept plump with $2 bills to reward me for my schoolwork. I saved the portrait, my masterpiece for last, being as it was so beautifully drawn and everything. My father picked the page up from the table and held it close to his face like he was looking for a message. Mother stood behind me, crossed her arms over my chest, and bent to place a kiss at the top of my head. It's okay, she said. Did you tell your teacher who was in the picture? I nodded, the whole time thinking that I probably should lie, although I wasn't quite sure why. James, Mother said, let's not make a molehill into a mountain. She's just a child. When, he said, this is important. Don't look so scared. I'm not going to take her out behind the woodshed. Then he chuckled, but my mother didn't laugh. All she did was draw a picture. Kids draw pictures. Gone in the kitchen, grinned James said, let me talk to my daughter. My mother said, why can't I stay here? She's my daughter too. You with her all the time. You tell me I don't spend enough time talking to her, so now let me talk. Mother hesitated, then released me. She's just a little kid, James. She doesn't even know the ins and outs yet. Trust me, James said. She left the room, but I don't know that she trusted him not to say something that would leave me wounded and broken winged for life. I could see it in her face. When she was upset, she moved her jaw around, invi around invisible gum. At night, I could hear her in her room grinding her teeth in her sleep. The sound was like gravel under car wheels. Dana, come here. James was wearing a Navy chauffeur's uniform. His hat must have been in the car, but I could see the ridge mark across his forehead where the hat band usually was. Come closer, he said. I hesitated, looking to the space in the doorway where Mother had disappeared. Dana, he said, you're not afraid of me, are you? You're not scared of your own father, are you? His voice sounded mournful, but I took it as a dare. No, sir, I said, taking a bold step forward. Don't call me sir, Dana. I'm not your boss. When you say that, it makes me feel like an overseer. I shrugged. Mother told me that I should always call him sir. With a sudden motion, he reached out for me and lifted me up on his lap. He spoke with both our faces looking outward, so I couldn't see his expression. Dana, I can't have you making drawings like the one you made for your art class. I can't have you doing things like that. What goes on in this house between your mother and me is grown people's business. I love you, you're my baby girl, and I love you, and I love your mama. But what we do in this house has to be kept secret, okay? But I didn't even draw this house. James sighed and bounced me on his lap a little bit. What happens in my life, in my world, doesn't have anything to do with you. You can't tell your teacher that your daddy has another wife. You can't tell your teacher that my name is James Witherspoon. Atlanta ain't nothing but a country town and everyone knows everybody. Your other wife and your other girl is a secret, I asked him. He put me down from his lap so we could look each other in the face. No, he said, you've got it the wrong way around. Dana, you are the one that's the secret. years ago and I am just really honored and grateful to be here this afternoon. It has been a very long road for me and, and for Silver Sparrow so I really appreciate you coming out. Um, I would be happy to talk to you some more. I take any questions you have or I could just talk to you. Your choice. Oh here comes a question because then I will tell you. Okay let's see what the question is. Very specific to me, so I'm sorry. But actually, I'm a writer and I'm working on my first novel. And I was just wondering what advice you would give to black writers who are trying not to get pigeonholed into urban fiction. 
addiction. Um, it's very difficult, and I was just wondering, I was thinking about getting into an MMA program. What are your thoughts on that? I think this, the, the advice really is the same for all writers, is that you have to write the story that you were meant to write. Once you commit to writing a story and writing, I'm going to call it a true story. When I say a true story, I don't mean it really happened, but just like what's true to your understanding of the world, that is your job. You can't help the way someone else reads you. You just can't help that. You just have to write your true story. Um, I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way. When I started writing Silver Sparrow, um, it was my second book. And I believe that having written two books before, that I would get another book contract and I would continue on my trajectory. I felt like I had worked hard, I had done well. And there was a shakeup in publishing. You know, all the different publishers were sold and all this kind of stuff. Short version is, I was without a publisher. Here I was, I'm thinking, I'm thinking I'm somebody, you know, and I've done my work. And I was rejected by my own publisher. And so then we sent the book out to other people who rejected it too. Like everybody was rejecting it because things were shaking up and people didn't want to take chances. And I felt like I was done. And I was thinking, oh, maybe if I write a different kind of book. But you know what? That's not me. I had to write the kind of book that I wrote. And I decided to write my book regardless. I was writing this book for the purpose of putting it in a drawer because I didn't want to say that I had let the business keep me from telling my story. So I wrote this book intending to put it in a drawer. I started focusing on it, started really like getting into it and putting my heart in it. And I put that out there. And then I got a mysterious phone call from an organization in LA telling me that I had won a, a grant, a $50,000 grant to go finish my book. Just like that, they called me. I thought they were telemarketing me when they called me. <laughs> I was really like, seriously, you all are gonna call broke me and ask me to give you money to give to someone else. And they're like, no, 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 you got the wrong way around. You know, you're getting this grant. And so I took their grant and finished the book, again, to put it in a drawer, but just so I could say that I finished this book. So I've done the book. I went to a writer's conference in Florida because I had already been invited and I didn't want to back out. But I was sad, you know, I felt like my hard work wasn't... Anyway, I gave a reading and a woman came up to me and she said, I think I can help you. I've heard what happened to you with your publisher. And then I was embarrassed, like, are strangers talking about me? Like, I was under the impression that I was keeping it together. And she was like, no, I heard what happened. That is a shame. And I was embarrassed and she said, but I can help you. And she carried me by the hand through a crowd. It's a big crowd like this. And she put my hand in the hand of a publisher and she told them, you should look at this young lady. I think she's, you know, got something. And I was embarrassed because I felt, you know, also I knew that it doesn't work like that. No one could put your hand in the hand of a publisher. Like that doesn't happen to people like me. And the publisher said, you know, she was interested and she said, but oh, by the way, before we go, she said, tell me, how do you know Judy? And I said, oh, I, I don't know anybody named Judy. And she says, no, no, no. Judy Bloom, who brought you over here. I looked out the crowd and she had vanished. It's like she was a mirage. But it was as though my nerdy childhood had come to rescue me. But I feel like it only happened because I committed to writing the story that I was meant to write. You know, and that once you do what you're supposed to do, you know, the universe, God, will open up and do the rest for you. And I think that's my advice is write your true story and just, you got to just walk out on faith with it. from Arizona State University and it was another one of those moments where I met the director of that MFA program in an elevator and she had seen my work and she said oh move to Arizona um, she said move to Arizona I'll help you I'll be your mentor and I was like oh no ma'am I can't move to Arizona it's hot out there <laughs> I said, also it's the only state that doesn't have the king holiday y'all may not remember that but Arizona you know I'm from Atlanta and she said oh no dear there's been a voter referendum and there'll be the king holiday by the time you get there <laughs> Again, I took a leap of faith. I moved out there. It was hot. It used to be 120. I moved out there and I didn't know anyone, but she was offering me the opportunity to work on my, you know, develop my craft for three years under her wing. And it worked out for me. I wrote my first book there. So I do believe that for me it was worth the investment. But the MFA program is only worth the investment if you are willing to make the investment. Like you can't go to the MFA program to meet people, to hang out. You have to go there to do your work. Uh, 
Hi, I'm from Atlanta as well. And um, I just finished reading your book, Civil Sparrow. And I was really disheartened. I was sad. I thought that, that Dana got the blood. That people have not finished this book? Uh, <laughs> okay, well, anyway, <laughs> the character, the father, I really kind of thought he got off, you know, pretty easily. Can you talk about who this is? say people didn't read this book yet. Okay. Can you talk about <laughs> And for the last 18 months, every day of my life, I have to say, my father is not a bigamist. <laughs> but I was moved to write this book because, you know what, we talk a lot about blended families, but a lot of us live in families that haven't blended. And I have two sisters who were born before I was, they were born before my parents ever met. So all my life, though, I felt like I had sisters that were just outside of my reach, that I didn't really know. They were living a separate life than mine. And my fantasy life was that, oh, somewhere out there I have sisters and they would do my hair. You know, all the things that people who don't have sisters think that having a sister is all about. But as I got to be an adult, I was really thinking, like, what must my life look like to them? Because we think of custody battles as parents having custody of children. But you know what? The children have custody of the parents. And I really grew up with custody of my father. I grew up, you know, with my father in the house with me. I saw my father every day. And I never thought of, I just thought of that as my family, not as a certain kind of privilege that I had. So I was really interested in thinking about this idea of people who have the same father but have different lives. And so I came to look at it from, from that point of view. But I feel like to write this book, I did have to have sympathy for all the characters. Like, I couldn't write this book as, like, this is a book designed to punish one of the characters. Like, you can't write, like, a school mom. You have to be open to everyone's position. And I thought about the bigamist, and I was like, how does he see himself? And I thought, this is how I think the bigamist thinks. He thinks, every time a woman has come to me and said that she is having my baby, I have married her. <laughs> he feels like I left nobody unmarried, and everybody is mad at me. He's like, how does that work? Point, even if it's a kind of twisted point, that's when you have an honest look at what happens to them. Which, is, which I wrote when I was in graduate school. It's about growing up in Atlanta during the child murders. When I was a kid in Atlanta, there was a serial murderer that killed um, about 30 African-American children, and two were students in my class. And everything I've ever read about the Atlanta child murders has been about the police. How did the police catch the murderer? Do you think this is the murderer? It, it became like a police procedural, which I think is a kind of gentrification of the narrative. I think of the child murders as a story of what happened in my community, but everything I've seen has been a story about the Atlanta police. And so I wanted to write it from the point of view that I knew of being a kid at that time, of growing up, like thinking about all the things everyone thinks about when they grow up. Like think about your training bra and a murderer, same day, same time. You know? And our childhood was kind of funny. People would say to me, people would say to me, oh, you must not have had a childhood. And I was like, no, we were children. We just, this happened in addition to our lives. One of my projects is looking at the ways that people live their lives at the same time that history is happening. So I put myself in that particular story. And the story is a little girl, and she just comes in every now and then, a little girl named Tiari Jones. And she does all the things that I do. Like I used to sniff the Xerox paper. Oh, it's a Xerox, but ditto. Mimeograph. Yes, yeah, she's always sniffing the mimeograph and getting a little loopy. So, but I thought it was important to me to look at the fact that even though this historic thing was happening, this horrific thing was happening, there was a little girl named Tiari Jones sniffing the mimeograph sheet at the same time. So that's why I put myself in there as kind of bearing witness. And I, don't, I put the story, the characters in the order they are, just in, I put them in escalating. I thought more, as they kept going, it got more interesting. You want your novel to go up in energy, not down. So that's what I put. the book now. I've had for years, I've had a letter from my 
Yes, all right. A couple of weeks ago, and I find it fascinating. I really enjoyed it a lot. But I wanted to ask you about the character of Uncle Ryan. I mean, I haven't finished the book, but I find him so sad the way he's treated. Oh, he's all right. And, <laughs> and I also found it interesting when you presented it, um, when he had the opportunity. Uh, 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 easy, easy, <laughs> easy. All right, let's. Okay. Easy. But I don't know why he's being treated the way he is. It's just like part of the Greek chorus or something. Well, I think that you cannot pull off local bigamy. You know, you normally read about the bigamy and the man has a wife in another state, like he's a traveling salesman. But if you're doing local bigamy, you need some infrastructure and some help, right? <laughs> Riley because I just figured, I couldn't figure out how it meant uh, two wives, two daughters need two men, right? So he has, James the Bigamist has a brother who helps him out with everything. And then also I felt like adding him to the narrative opened it up because it's just like if you're in a real relationship, you cannot be there with, you know, you just can't be alone with your man all the time discussing your relationship. You need another person just to bring in some other topics, some fresh air. And that's why I brought Raleigh in there, just to let the people do something besides be in their relationship. And I think that he is treated the way he is because, well, you haven't gotten far enough. Let me just say, it will reveal itself. Hi, Terry. My name is Karen. Um, I read some notes. I actually tweeted you earlier. Yes, you did. Um, I read Silver Sparrow and I noticed, um, when I reviewed your book, I noticed that you shout out HBCUs variously, like Hampton and Spelman. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to know how your Spelman experience shaped you as an author and shaped um, your writing. Okay, I'm a graduate of Spelman College, a historically black women's college in Atlanta. <laughs> say that Spelman College made me the woman I am today. Were it not for Spelman College, I would not be standing here. I had a lot of experiences, you know, after it, but I went to Spelman, I was very young, I was 16. I was the youngest person in my class. I knew I wanted to write, but I did not know that I could be a writer. I was always treated like my writing was, I think that when girls, when young girls write and read in the library a lot, people don't necessarily interpret that as you being an intellectual. They think that means that you're nice, you know, like you're a sweet girl. As they say, you know, nobody ever got pregnant in the library. So, you know, when you go to the library, it's just like, good, you're such a good girl, you're not giving your parents any trouble. And when I went to Spelman, the fact that I like to write and read was seen as a real, a real asset and something meaningful. So I was at Spelman, and this is when Janetta Cole was just made president. And I was walking, this is in the 80s. Remember people used to power walk like that in the 80s? And she was power walking by, and she said to me, hello there, how's the writing? No one had ever asked me how's the writing. She was the most impressive person I'd ever met, and she remembered me. And I thought, next time I see her, I need to have something to say. And so I started taking myself seriously. And then I took a creative writing class from Pearl Clegg. And this was before Pearl was on Oprah and got famous. This is when she was a working writer. And she kind of modeled to me what happens when you take yourself seriously and write for your own sake. And I believe that that is what sent me on this journey that I'm on right now. Silver Sparrow, it was really my interactions with people that I didn't know in real life that kept me going. When I was having all this drama, you know, trying to find a publisher and stuff, people who I didn't know would write to me and say, when's your next book coming out? I'm, I'm waiting on it. Or people would send me big goods in the mail. One woman knitted an Afghan and sent it to my job. And it was helpful to me to know that there were people out there that cared about what I was doing. So I didn't really feel like I was losing my privacy. I felt like I had a community of people that I, ha that I hadn't really met, but that were kind of holding me down when things were difficult for me. Um, and so that's kind of the stage where I am. So I think it really depends on your relationship with your readership. Like, 
I just find, I feel like I have the best readers in the world and that I, like I need them in my life. They're part of my process, actually. Like on my blog, I did a thing in April called Write Like, in August called Write Like Crazy. Oh, you wrote like crazy with me? Yeah, I did this thing where people, you try to write like crazy in August. We all wrote together. We reported how much writing we were doing. These are people I don't know. They're my readers. And it made, we were all in this. So I feel like they've become part of my process. Hello, nice to meet you. My name is Adrian Ochoa. I'm a visiting from England in regards to a project called the New Voice Writing Project. So uh, I would like to ask, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's so hard for people sometimes to open up and uh, say stories just uh, as they are, like you are telling us about uh, this father. And I really thought it was your real father. So what can you say uh, to you know, upcoming writers, to new voices, bad writers, and how can they be courageous to, to tell stories, especially uh, when they are open writers writing and young people who can yeah. tell stories as they are? Well, I think the main thing of being a young writer is to think of yourself as a writer. You know, like, I believe once you believe that you are a writer, it follows that you understand that you have something worthwhile to say, and it builds like that. And to tell a true story, I always tell young writers and beginning writers, people are just starting, unplug from the business. Do not subscribe to, what's this email you get where it tells you how much money everyone else is getting for their book that's not you? Um, publisher's Lunch, I think it's what it's called. You know, don't subscribe to that. Don't read articles about what editors are looking for. None of that will help you finish your book. The only thing that will help you finish your book is listening to your own heart. And all that other stuff is distraction. And I believe that once you just have a community of writers and people that care about what you're doing, that believe in you and you believe in them, the doors in your heart will open on their own. When, it, when it's safe for that door to be open, it will open. So you put yourself in a safe and nurturing space. Thank you so much. Yes, we were at the uh, New Voices Seminar down in the U.S. Yes. And it was obvious that we were going to And uh, Was it obvious how upset I was? Oh, bless. Okay. No. No, it was very impressive. People like Dino Diaz was also a great success. Uh, what do you have in plans? I'm working, I'm working on a new novel now. I've become really interested in um, people who are exonerated from prison. I, I've watched documentaries, and a documentary always ends when they get out of prison. That's the end of the story. But I've always been interested in what's next. And I've all, so I'm interested in a woman, the idea of a woman whose husband was wrongfully in prison. He was given a 25-year sentence. She thought he was gone for good. But he gets out after seven years, and he's back on her doorstep. You know, kind of like the Odyssey. You know, he the man comes back, and he really has, in many ways, come back from war. But she has, it's been seven years. You know, she's moved on in many ways. And it's really a question about what is loyalty, fidelity, and what is it reasonable to ask another person to do. This story came to me when I imagined a man and a woman in an argument, and the woman says to the man, Come on, you know you would not have waited on me for seven years. And we can pretty much agree on that, right? <laughs> and he says, this wouldn't happen to you in the first place, which is also true. So it's about what is it when, commit when commitment is not equal, but it can't be equal, what do you do? So that's what I'm, I'm working on. And her new man, his name is Andre, he's their um, mutual friend. Pages in, so it's gonna probably another year at least while I work on it. Yeah, well, you, as all the other writers I listen to today, speak very strongly about writing for yourself. Write what you know, it's your you when it's hell. But at some point, you have to share a book. So, you have to share. How do you trust your feedback you get? How do you know the person reading it? Maybe it's just not their style. Maybe they had a different idea. At what point do you know whose feedback to trust and whose feedback to trust? Well, one thing in dealing with feedback, 
I, I think it's very important that you share your book with people you, with you trust. First off, you learn the hard way about who to show your work to and who not to. You can tell when someone's giving you feedback from a bad place. But also, though, someone can give you good feedback from a bad place. Like they can give you good advice with an attitude, and you can respond to the attitude and not the advice. One thing I think about, I used to have a boyfriend that was a painter, and when he would alter his paintings, he could never get the original back because he's changed the painting forever. But as a writer, you can take anyone's advice because you still have your original. I try almost any piece of advice given. If it sounds halfway reasonable, I'll try it. You know, if someone says, take this character out or add this, I'll try it. And if I don't like it, I still have my original. And I think that's the thing, it's like not to be too proud to try because you don't lose anything. And that's what I do. Because I've had some really good help. Like when I wrote Silver Sparrow, it wasn't originally two sisters. It was really complicated. It was like two sisters and then another one who was the sister of one and wasn't the sister of another. It was a lot. And, but I thought it was brilliant. And somebody said to me quite dismissively, that's too complicated. Like that, like really funky, like that's too complicated. And it hurt my feelings and I felt like it was coming from a bad place. But she was right. That's why I changed the book. When you were uh, having some problems with your uh, potential publisher on Silver Sparrow, and seeing that you've already had two novels that were published prior to that, and you have a following, did you ever consider self-publishing and just bypassing traditional uh, distribution? I did not consider self-publishing because I don't think that I have the necessary skill set to do all the things you have to do. If you self-publish, you have to market, you have to distribute, you have to design your own cover. I have no idea how to do any of these things. You know, so I just, it just wasn't on the list of, well, and who knows what I would have done if things hadn't worked out, you know, the way that they did, but I feel like self-publishing is an incredible commitment, and you have to be really prepared to do it all. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us what writers you've met since you became famous, who you get giddy about and want to talk to you the way we would like to talk to you. <laughs> Um, I think the most, the one experience, probably when I met, um, when I met Nikki Giovanni, when my first book came out, you know, she wrote to me, invited me up to Virginia Tech, and I came up there, and then she invited me and her editor back to her home. You know, we spent like a weekend at Nikki Giovanni's. I couldn't believe it, right? I was so, I was just, I felt like, you know, I read her when I was in high school, and now I'm at her house having dinner. That was really exciting, and she gave me such wonderful advice about having a long writing career. And she was the one who told me, take care of your readers because they're the ones that will take care of you. And that is the best advice I ever had. And this is when my first book came out, before any of anything happened to come, that she said that. She said, every person that reads your book is doing you a favor. They have all these things they can read. They chose to read your book. So you should always, you know, make time when you go do appearances, whatever, because each one of them has, like, extended a kindness towards you, and you should always remember that. And that was probably the best experience I had with meeting a writer in real life. because there are both, and I think that's really important to think about. I mean, one of the obvious things, there's been a lot in the news lately, in the, in the writer news, which isn't even the real news, but when you're a writer, you feel like it's the news. But, um, you know, with women writers and this idea that, you know, they have those stats that break down, like how few women are reviewed in the New York Times, how few women are, and then if you add black women, it's more and more and more. So there's a certain kind of feeling of marginalization in, in the praise factor, I would say, but I think, that you just have to get over that. Like you don't write your book for the New York Times. You know, like you, it really forces you to be, it, having that kind of marginal place forces you not to care as much about that other stuff. You know, and it is a challenge, but I feel like, I feel like you have to know why you write. And I think that's true for everyone. And that when you're a woman or you're black, you're just made to face it earlier in your career. Like other people can go years and years and years before they realize that they don't write for the New York Times. But you need to know that right off the bat. But the pleasure of it is that when you write a subject matter, like I write about Atlanta, I think 
that anybody here from Atlanta? All right. When you see Atlanta landmarks in the book that you've never seen anywhere else, there's that shock of realization of seeing something that you know in real life in a book. And I believe that sharing that and being a part of that, it's rewarding beyond words. I can't tell you how much that means to me. That's the thing that gets me up out of bed in the morning. That's the thing that gets me writing. And I, I just have to focus on that. None of us need to be writing for the awards. You know, none of us need to write for the reviews. And I know I've said this a million times, but I think that that is the thing that will keep you going from one book to the next, to the next, to the next. Once you put your faith in this outside stuff, it's like, you know, putting your faith in man. You can't. you got to put your faith where it really, ha you know, you have to put your faith for whence it comes. something that makes it feel like fun and play and also with a computer you can type and you can get in a mood and push three keys and delete a day's work with a typewriter you can throw a piece of paper away but the next morning when you come to your senses you can smooth it out you know you still have your work so that's one thing I think about my process is I use typewriters I write by hand I don't compose on the computer um, I usually start with character but sometimes I get an idea for a plot I feel like the less I can say I do it this way, the less likely I am to be blocked. Because if you believe there are 10 different ways to do it, if one way isn't working, you try another way and another way and another way. But I do think that when you finish the book, it needs to seem like you started with character. But I believe you should just start with whatever, whatever keeps you going. My mentor, Ron Carlson, would say, do whatever you have to do to survive the draft. I spent in Nigeria. Um, when I was a teenager, I spent um, a couple of years in Nigeria. My parents had a Fulbright and they wanted us to, you know, become citizens of the world. And so I, I worked, I lived in Nigeria, I went to high school there. And I learned a lot. For one thing, I learned a lot about education. They take education much more seriously than we do. Like they, they do some homework over there. And not doing your homework in Nigeria is like, it's like you've been given this education and you didn't do your homework. Unlike here, you know, the kind of way we take for granted, how we come up with, like, you're kind of cute with your teacher, explain why you don't have your homework, and it's funny. Over there, if you don't do your homework, it is not funny. And it was very, I think it changed my work ethic. It really changed my work ethic. It helped me understand myself as a, as, as a student, like what it really meant, what it really meant to be a student. Since then, I've done a lot of traveling abroad, and I've led workshops. I led a workshop in Uganda last year. And it was for women. I led a workshop for women. And I met so many women who want to tell their stories. And for its own sake, like they just want to get it down on the page. And I feel that teaching in all the different environments that I teach has been so helpful to my own. When you see the way that writers in other countries approach their work, I think it gives you a sense of purpose. We as writers have it very easy in the United States. I know we think we don't have it easy because rejection, like we think rejection is the end of the world. But rejection, here you just apply somewhere else, but people in other countries, they have real challenges to get in their voice out. People in other countries, their work is often censored. Like, writing is not just a hobby, it's, it's survival. It's about telling a story that will be lost. And I feel that it, as an American writer, having studied with people from other countries, it gives me a, like really a different sense of what the possibility for narrative, what narrative can achieve for people. My new book will be called Dear History. It will be published by Algonquin Books. 
and I'm, I'm working on it. You know, the thing about working on a new story is that when you work on a new novel, it's not a novel. It, it's not fully formed. You know, when you read it from front to beginning to end, it feels like it was written that way. But for a novel, you have these long portions when you just have to have faith that the novel will become clearer to you, will get better to you. Because you don't know the characters very well yet. You have like a sense of their problems. You don't know, you don't know how they are. You don't know what happened to them when they were a child. I feel like I know a character when I figure out what happened to him or her when she was young that made her like she is today. Like what I read in Silver Sparrow when Dana is told, no, you are the secret. When I, I didn't come up with that in the beginning. Actually, I came up with that later. But once I came up with that, I was able to go, to go forward with the rest of the book. So I'm still looking for what was that moment that formed the personalities of the characters. And I'm not quite, I'm just not quite there yet. And I feel like I'm just hanging on. I, I just believe that one day I'll be at my typewriter and I'll type the sentence and it'll be the answer. All right, going once. Says she's a northerner and she wants to know about Atlanta. You know, I grew up under the impression that Atlanta was the center of the universe. It wasn't until I went to graduate school at the University of Iowa that I found out that there were people in the world who were not obsessed with Atlanta, Georgia. Like, my, around my relatives, we were the ones who lived in, like, the most exciting city. So I, I never knew that I was kind of writing an experience that had been silenced. I just thought everybody thought Atlanta was the best city. But I like, um, Atlanta, when I was growing up, was considered to be like the African-American Mecca. That in the 70s and 80s, it was the only city in America that had a black school board president, black um, mayor, black police chief. Like my daddy would say, they have black everything down here. And that's why he, he moved from a small town in Louisiana to Atlanta. I always felt myself to be, in some ways, a child of an immigrant. Like, my daddy was in the old country, was rural Louisiana, where he was from, and that I grew up in the brave new world. So I always write about Atlanta with a certain, I think, a certain self-confidence. And also that African-American educational system in Atlanta with all the black colleges. Like in Atlanta, I was, I was in Atlanta, I was looking for a doctor. I asked this woman I know for what doctor, and she recommended a doctor. She said, you know, he didn't go to Morehouse. She said, but he went to Harvard, and he's a pretty good doctor. You know? <laughs> So I grew up with that worldview, and I think I write out of that place, but I never thought it was a unique voice. Or growing up in Atlanta during the child murders, I thought everybody knew about the Atlanta child murders until I went to graduate school and people were saying, child murders, what child murders? And so I learned that what I thought was kind of a, a well-known, kind of in a universal database of experience wasn't. And I think that helped me find my voice because I didn't know that I had a unique, I did not know that what I did not regard to be a unique experience was a unique experience. And I think it, it's what helps my writing. I feel like it's a world that I know about and I feel like a tour guide to it sometimes. I feel like for people who don't know what it is, it's a tour guide to Southwest Atlanta as I know it. And for people who know what I know, I feel like it's like looking through a photo, an old photo album, remembering things you thought you forgot. Well, I um, I just let's see what have I read? I've been reading a lot of mysteries lately, like literary mysteries. I think reading mysteries is helpful to me because it reminds me to keep it moving. Because sometimes I think when you're a writer and you think you're an intellectual, you get caught up in your ideas and you forget that something has to happen in this book. <laughs> so I've been reading a lot of mysteries. I, like everyone else in America, I read Gone Girl. Y'all read that? Wasn't that good? Yeah, I read that. Um, I just got through reading The Cutting Season by Atta Kalak. It came out like Tuesday. It was a really awesome historical mystery. It's about an um, African-American woman who is, plans weddings at what is a decommissioned, like a plantation. And she plans, like it's become like a, it's like guided tours of hell. It's like a tourist site that is this slavery site and then there's a murder. So I read that was really good. And I just, she just put this thing up said over time, so. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress.
visit us at loc.gov.